Well, sustainability for any forward thinking organization must be at the top of the agenda. And certainly sustainability targets uh, now assume a much more challenging nature for boards and chief executives in our industry. So with today, we're tackling the sustainability imperative. And we're going to do that um, in three ways. We're going to, we've got a, a brand new piece, well, we've got a preview of a brand new piece of research, uh, which, which gives us a very good sort of position on this. We're going to talk to a strategic expert on the subject, uh, a business that specializes in uh, getting a, a good ESG strategy together. And we're going to be talking to an exponent of that strategy, um, a, a, an industry case study, uh, a retailer who's who's doing it and get a get an update on on how their their year is going uh, as they're as they're rolling this out. So um, let's get on with the program today. Um, we've got an audience of 28 countries. Please just get the questions uh, keep putting the questions through. And what I'll try and do is, is bring them into the, the discussion as we go through, through today's program. So um, just, just keep putting the questions in and I'll do my best to get through most of them by the end of the program. I'm welcome. I, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Dev Dillon uh, as our first guest today. How are you doing, Dev? Good, thanks, Dan. Now, just to give you a sort of proper intro, Dev, um, you are one of the authors of of, of the upcoming um, paper six of your shape of food retailing in the new normal report, which this one deals with sustainability. And thank you very much, firstly, for giving me um, a pre-read. This comes out in early October, doesn't it? Yeah, we're um, we're just finalising it. It's um, It's been a paper that I think we've been very, very keen to write for some time. Um, but even this week, reading the retail press in the UK with... Um, Boots, Morrisons, Waitrose and Tesco's all announcing initiatives around sustainability. It feels like a very timely report as well. Yeah, it almost seems like things are really hotting up, doesn't it? Because we're, I, I suppose, you know, obviously retailers have been working on all these things for a long time, but the media now seems to be putting its focus on on, on more and more on, on sustainability, doesn't it? Which obviously makes it more important to consumers, um, perhaps. Yeah, and, you know, we, we've spent the last 18 months in our reports, you know, focusing on um, the disruption, the strategic changes and all those headwinds of change that have been linked to the pandemic. And you, you could have thought that over that 18 month period, subjects such as sustainability would almost take a back seat. But in reality, certainly from the research that we've done and speaking to uh, industry stakeholders, it very much feels as if sustainability has come to the forefront um, because the world suddenly feels a bit more fragile than it did 18 months ago. And, you know, we've got regular reports of kind of extreme heat, flooding, forest fires, and, you know, we're, we're all a little bit alarmed and I think much more aware as consumers that um, we have to be more responsible towards our planet. Absolutely. Now, I found the, the, the pre-read you sent me of the report um, really, really interesting. In the next um, few minutes, you're going to sort of give us some of the highlights that, that, that we can expect that you focused on. And, and I'll give you my thoughts a little bit on, on, um, on, on what I took away as well as we get to the end of your segment. So take it away, Dev. Tell us, um, tell us about what's coming up in, uh, in this report. Okay, thank you, Dan. So the, um, I mean, an interesting part for us is it, it does feel as if the world is beginning to develop a bit more consensus around um, the, the urgency and the need for sustainability. Uh, in the last few months, clearly some political shifts have meant that there's a bit more consensus. But the good news is that industry in general is taking this very seriously. Um, if you were to look at that diagram, uh, what it represents is essentially uh, a kind of uh, a visual capture of the feedback that we received from uh, the retailers that we, uh, we spoke to. Uh, and they almost can be put into three, three kind of distinct areas. Uh, one where retailers regard sustainability in almost a philosophical way, i.e. the type of business that we are. Secondly, where sustainability is talked about in terms of intentions, i.e. what we intend to do. And then many retailers who are now talking about solutions, i.e. what we are doing. Now, I'm, I'm more inspired by um, those that are talking about solutions, i.e. the big multicoloured area on the right than uh, compared to those on the left. 
But I think more importantly, if you speak to consumers, um, certainly the bits of research that have been done, there's very clear evidence now that consumers are gravitating towards those retailers that are providing solutions on sustainability, because it's not something that you can solve yourself as a, as a consumer. Now, you might look at that diagram and say, wow, there are a lot of retailers that are talking as opposed to doing. But I would argue that if we would conducted this same exercise two years ago, the box on the left would be even bigger. Uh, and I suspect that if we were to do this again in two years time, a, a higher number of retailers would be talking about what they're actually doing as opposed to what they intend to do or their kind of broad philosophy um, around, around uh, sustainability itself. Makes a lot of sense. Now, Dev, I know the start of your report is a, has a foreword, which is written by Andrew Thornton, who obviously, according to a number of, and you, you quote in your report, according to a number of multiple CEOs, changed, uh, changed the world with one store in terms of uh, single-use approach towards single-use packaging. Yeah, and, and Andrew often talks about the fact that um, that was his objective. So he, he did this to prove that it could be done by one store um, without necessarily having to spend huge amounts of money on research and development, just by having a, a per, clear purpose, it, it was the it underpinned his business, a team that were passionate about doing it, um, and him fully supporting that through his through his um, his his kind of focus on it. So um, he proved it, and uh, and he could deliver it. Uh, one of the other areas that we picked up in um, in this report that was clear and you can you can see it as a red thread i think as you read through the retailer feedback yeah is that part of the challenge is actually defining what sustainability is so um, if you go back sustainability was very much a term that was used in forestry agriculture but in broader terms um, it's kind of understood to be uh, you know something sustainable if it meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And that, that's the United Nations definition, which is probably a kind of fair summary of, um, of what it is. I think where, where people have now be, begun to dissect it, I think in more kind of useful, actionable detail, is uh, where they talk about three dimensions. So we often refer to the triple bottom line, which is people, planet uh, and prosperity. So people being where uh, it relates to the social impact of an activity, planet relating to the ecological impact uh, and an activity uh, which, where, which links to prosperity being fundamentally the kind of economic one. Yeah. Um, now, you're, you're sustainable um, if you can be placed in the middle of that kind of triumvirate of, uh, of dimensions that I've meant that we've talked about. But the, um, you know, whilst that's the most commonly accepted dimension, I think what's really interesting is this move that you can see on the diagram where the kind of historical focus has been on defensive sustainability management and that's where brands and providers avoid doing harm um, but in a modern context if you're a, if you're a brand and you you do want to survive um, doing harm is kind of like the basis of your of what you provide to consumers um, if you do bad, your consumers have a long memory these days, and it's very difficult to recover. Um, you know, the impact of the Rana Plaza garment factory collapse in Bangladesh is probably the most recent example of brands that had you know, seriously suffered because of their association with um, uh, practices around human beings and labor, um, whilst their messaging to consumers about their ethos and their sustainability were very different. Uh, and it has taken it has taken a concerted effort for them to fix the issue in their supply chain to get customer faith back again. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I think that um, focus to kind of proactive sustainability, sustainability management, i.e. where you are actually delivering a net benefit to people, planet and prosperity is is much more important. And um, and this is a good news story for us in the convenience industry in particular, because we've been excellent at being champions of community projects so it completely fits in with that box of kind of proactive sustainability and we've got to learn to shout about it a bit more so that that would be my advice on that definition piece it's if you're a business and you're serious about sustainability it is worth understanding those definitions because whilst it's really important to be focused on solutions you need to put it in a framework that's coherent and relevant because it, this does often get confused with csr as well um, and anyone who is unfortunate enough to have to read PLC reports that go to the city, you know, you can see that that can, you know, there isn't 
there isn't a common language yet around sustainability that consumers can understand, uh, which is the most important thing. I guess to that point, it was Andrew's success. He actually increased sales in his store by 4%, didn't he? By giving consumers a, a solution that, uh, that they could understand and, uh, you know, and, 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 and make, make use of. Yeah, and that's that was that's Andrew's, you know, really really strong quote that comes across in the paper. My consumers wanted solutions, and I gave them solutions. So, great way to start the the, the report, I thought. And um, what what else what else do you cover, Deb? Um, so, if we now kind of focus on some of the specific areas, so ethical sourcing. So, um, now this has moved on a great deal over the last decade, um, and just kind of to help you know, clear any avoidance of doubt, by ethical sourcing, I'm I'm referring to local sources, local sourcing versus national versus international, um, the supply chain logistics and the carbon footprint, fair trade and various other accreditations like Rainforest Alliance, human rights and living standards, including labor rights, modern slavery, deforestation, water, water security, supply chains and global poverty and cruelty-free animal husbandry practices. So that's quite a lot in there in terms of how your supply chain is deemed to be one that's that fits within those dimensions that we talked about previously. If you're an FMCG supplier, you've, you've had the foresight really to put this at the heart of your, your kind of business strategy. So Unilever have removed 49% of the water used in their manufacturing since 2008, which is no small amount. Most confectionery producers now have established fair trade or rainforest alliance supply chains kind of for their standard chocolate bars. Sometimes they don't even mention it in, in huge ways on the packaging, but it's just part of what they do. Yeah. Um, and the example that I've got on the page there is the kind of rapid increase in sustainable palm oil production over the last 20, 12 years. So you can see on the left hand side where it came from and where it is today. Um, now, that whole industry of palm oil was had to shift on its access because consumers very quickly became aware of the level of deforestation associated with palm oil and the plight of species such as the orangutan. It's a very visible and disturbing image um, to have on your screens. Now, there are going to be other industries that go through that um, same cycle and have to respond very quickly. But for me, the key, key take out here is if you're in the world of food service and convenience, it's just don't, don't rely on manufacturers or your supply chain to tell your story. We know from research that consumers in your stores don't see your supply chain as being one entity and from you as opposed to from your manufacturers. So whether it comes to things like local sourcing, food miles, animal husbandry, labor rights, create your own narrative and make those stories easily accessible for your customers. Just like Andrew did, and, and, and this is a, a photo of, his, his, of what was his store in, uh, in North London, uh, near Hampstead Heath. Yeah, totally, and this is um, it's, I mean, it's a great image of what he did. Um, now, perhaps if you were to put it in today's context, it doesn't look as innovative, but it, it did because, you know, several years ago, because he was the first. Uh, and that's testament to the fact that he inspired others to, um, to follow, follow likewise. Um, so his store in North London, uh, for those of you that don't know, um, uh, the, the Thornton's Budgins, uh, really led the agenda on a number of things, but was famous for removing single-use plastic. Um, and he, he was, I mean, Andrew is a very kind of considered and thoughtful retailer who really um, is an expert on strategy, um, which is reflected in what he does today, actually, now he sold the store. But he understood that um, the kind of creek, the three common ways to reduce packaging are either to reduce, i.e. by replacing packaging with no packaging or with alternatives, to recycle, um, i.e. to you know, get rid of single-use plastic or reuse. Um, you know, and that's where packaging can be used multiple times by kind of consumers or, or, or the retailer themselves. So he, he understood the context very well. He brought in the right expertise and he was focused on solutions. Um, but also, I think what, what kind of happened hand in hand with this change is recogn a recognition that things can change very quickly when it comes to packaging and uh, disposables. So for those of you um, that you might remember that in the UK, a documentary, uh, The Blue Planet, uh, by a famed kind of natural historian, David Attenborough, led to most operators having to completely remove plastic straws from their offers within three months. Um, you know, and it was very disruptive uh, for people in um, kind of casual dining and QSR. 
Um, but it happened and it happened very quickly. You, you wouldn't want to be seen as a retailer that had it. Now, I know that COVID's kind of changed attitudes a little bit on packaging because we've got this increased need for hygiene. Um, but, you know, that, that will go. Um, most of the, the kind of advice we're getting from experts and the data suggests that we'll move on and we'll be looking for the types of solutions that, that Andrew brought to life. But Andrew was really good. He said, look, don't overestimate the practical and commercial challenges. The solutions are there. They're readily available and easy to implement if you're willing. And if you put them in, your customers are going to love you for it. Now, you've got some pictures there of, of clean loop recycling, Dev. Just tell us a bit about that. And I think the regulator, obviously, in your report, you cover the regulatory uh, side of things, which is obviously crucial in ensuring a level playing field, isn't it? So that, you know, a single store retailer can afford to, to jump first. But if you've got a big chain of stores, you know, it, it's much more difficult, isn't it? Yeah. And you, I mean, there are markets like Germany that are much more mature. Uh, when it comes to deposit return schemes. Um, but also, I think, uh, you know, we, for, for nations like the UK, which will go down this route in a, you know, because of legislation, we should take comfort from the fact that there are lots of great technical solutions out there that we can now buy into as well. Now, I know, I know there's been quite a bit of vocal resistance to implementing DRS in the UK, both from retailers and from those that represent them. But Dan, I'm fundamentally in the kind of opposite camp on this. I think this is a great example of uh, an initiative that's proven in other countries. There are great solutions that you can take off the shelf and implement. And if you market it in the right way, um, it will really resonate with your customers. So, you know, you might have challenges because of space, but, you know, that's not a unique challenge to you as an operator. And there are going to be solutions that are fit for purpose for you. And if you're a small kind of local retailer, um, I think this is a great example of, of a way that you can connect your consumers around sustainability. Um, so I'm, I'm all in favour of it. 100%. Uh, well, just coming to the end of this, this segment, um, I think there's one more slide, isn't there? Um, perhaps we could just, could just share that and then uh, finishing, finishing with, a, with a quote, Dev. Yeah, I'd, um, one of the areas that I think is a, a very strong sentiment throughout the piece is the need to be authentic. Um, the last re research that we saw in 2020 from Cap Gemini suggested that two thirds of executives um, said that their consumers were aware of their sustainability issues, but 49% of consumers said they needed more information to verify those claims. So when you've got a retailer like Andrew Thornton that puts in a huge plastic free section, um, that feels real, that feels authentic. Where you've got the opposite, um, you know, and customers think you're greenwashing, I'm more and more convinced that you will um, find that those customers disengage with you because you're talking the talk and not walking the walk. Very good. Now, Dev, so um, please stay on and come back for the discussion at the, towards the end of the programme. Um, but your report will be out early October, and I, I really recommend uh, taking a look at it um, because of all the inputs you've had from global retailers and suppliers around the world, you know, it's a very useful uh, piece of work. So thank you for that. Thank you for sharing it, uh, it, it with me before today's program. We'll talk about it a bit more later on, I should think. Now, thank you, Deb, if I, if I could um, bring, bring you back later. And let me welcome <clears throat> Nate Marsh, who's Chief Solutions Officer at Greenprint, um, dialing in from the US. Hello, Nate. Hey, Dan. So, Nate, just tell us a bit more, a little in introduction to Greenprint and what you do, just very briefly, before we look at some of the interesting stuff that you, you're going to talk about today. Yeah, so, so Greenprint, as Dan mentioned, we're, we're located in Atlanta, Georgia, in the U.S., but we actually operate in more than 20 countries around the world today. And Greenprint is a uh, sustainability solutions company, and what that ultimately means is uh, we work with partners to implement uh, ESG strategy, as well as sustainability programs and solutions to actually engage with customers and differentiate their brands through sustainability. And so what people are probably most familiar with on Greenprint is what we do within the retail fuel space with folks like Maxall, Circle K and others, and also on the fleet side in terms of offsetting tailpipe emissions. Uh, but what I'm really excited to talk about today with you guys is uh, a new division that we launched a little a little bit uh, before, or I guess just as COVID was hitting, uh, our Greenprint Labs division, and then to specifically kind of walk you guys through on the consumer side, where Dev talked a lot about 
uh, how retailers were approaching sustainability. Uh, Greenprint uh, released a study earlier this year that we call our Business of Sustainability Index. So looking forward to taking you guys through that here today. Well, let's take a look at it. And I've got quite a few questions. I think obviously the the the, the how climate consciousness impacts consumer preference is 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 a big is a big deal, isn't it? And uh, it's absolutely kind of vital for us to to bear in mind. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. And I think Dev Dev did a great job. I think highlighting some of the points that you'll see throughout our study. Again, this is the the 2021 Business of Sustainability Index. We released it earlier this year. This is out of our labs division. Um, and this is a study where, where we're tracking the, the sentiment around sustainability in the economy. So thinking about how climate consciousness impacts consumer preference and perceptions of companies and their products across various sectors. And of course, inside of that, including retail fuel. This is something that we hope to do on an annual basis. The initial uh, uh, study that we did was focused on the U.S., I think, in future years. Uh, we'll be able to uh, evolve that to, to some of these other countries where I think we'll, we'll get even greater insights. But when we start on this first slide, what we're looking at here is, again, the customers or the cus uh, consumers' willingness to pay more for products that are sustainable or that have sustainable components to it. Um, and of course, the first thing that jumps out on the page to you is uh, millennials, 75% of those expressing a willingness to do that. I don't think that's terribly surprising to folks, Dan. I think we all expect uh, that generation to, to be a bit more proactive on that. Um, but what I do think might surprise some folks is that more than half of baby boomers said that they're willing to pay more as well. And I think what this means is that there's still, of course, some groups that have a higher propensity towards sustainability, but it's really increasing in importance across all segments. And what I think we're going to see is that that shift will continue towards the importance of not only taking action as a brand, uh, but doing so in a way that engages your customers and matches their desires to support those environmentally friendly brands. Very, very interesting. Makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And as, as we kind of roll forward, um, you know, where we did start to see a little bit more of a divide between the, the various generations was in the financial sector. Um, I think everybody's pretty well aware in terms of, of, of what we're seeing with folks like BlackRock and others in terms of institutional lending patterns around ESG. But when we think about how Gen Z and millennials engage with, with uh, brands, excuse me, and how they pursue the causes that are important to them, what we see is that these groups tend to want the, the action to be simple and immediate. And they don't want to jump through hoops. They want to feel like they're sharing with the brands and the institutions in terms of the responsibility. And so what we've seen and, and how we've kind of asked the questions and talked to folks is there's opportunity uh, with things like credit cards uh, that uh, as an automatic feature of the card will enable them to offset carbon emissions. Uh, emissions excuse me. Similarly, uh, when we think within the retail sector and we look at things like loyalty programs, uh, that opportunity is similar there for folks where if we can implement strategies uh, through our loyalty programs for our customers where they can take advantage of, of the ability to make more sustainable choices through those platforms, it's, it's of interest uh, and increasingly so uh, for each generation down the curve. And I think where we saw our first kind of big surprise in terms of the sustainability index was in uncovering what we're kind of calling the trust gap. And I think this is a really interesting uh, kind of uh, paradigm that we're in where consumers are starting as Dev highlighted in his presentation, really starting to stand up and demand change around climate change and expecting brands to take action there. But um, even though consumers want to help fight climate change through things like carbon offsetting uh, and with businesses in their decision making, they don't yet still universally believe companies when they claim to be environmentally conscious. And I think when you look at on the right hand side of, of the slide there, um, there, there are a couple of things that folks can very easily do to begin to build that trust 
with customers, right? Almost half of folks that we talked to said that if you had an independent third party that was validating what you were doing or your methodology, that that would help build trust. Um, simple things like submitting an annual report every year that showed the progress that brands were making towards their sustainability goals. And then ultimately, really the, the easiest thing that brands can do, which is having uh, your CEO or your executive team out in front talking about why ESG is so important to the brand. What are the steps that we're taking? What's the progress? Being intentional and transparent in the communication. And so I think the big takeaway for us was, um, you know, an action like offsetting packaging alone uh, or, or even changing to alternatives may not have the same positive impact on consumers as that same action when we communicate it in the larger context of the, the entire ESG strategy. I think it's very interesting, Nate, and I suppose it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? You know, the consumer's prepared to spend more in many cases, obviously, particularly with younger generations, um, if, if they feel that's, that's justified, validated and evidenced, you know, in a, in a, in a credible way. And I, I, it's entirely sensible when you, when you look at it like that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think ultimately what they're looking for um, is transparency, right? So, so if, if you're asking me and informing me to make a decision that is in fact better, help me to understand why it's better and then validate that what you are doing, you are in fact doing. Don't, don't ask a customer to rely entirely on your word as the brand uh, that this is in fact happening and having the impact uh, that you suggest that it is. And so I think it's, it's really easy uh, for, for brands to step out and, and continue to build that trust. Um, but it is an interesting thing to keep on, an eye on as we look at future years as we do the survey, which is, can we start to close that trust gap between what brands are doing uh, and how consumers feel about that? Yeah, makes, makes sense. I think the other thing that, that we started to look at uh, within this index study, we, we really targeted multiple different business sectors uh, to better understand how consumers viewed those sectors and, and their general approach towards sustainability. And across the various sectors that we examined, uh, retail and convenience stores generally received poor marks across all demographics uh, as it related to sustainability, while sectors like food production, grocery, technology, CPG brands generally fared pretty well. And I think some of that has to do with um, perhaps the ease of, of implementing strategies, but also the fact that particularly on technology and, and grocery, as Dev has highlighted, they've, they've started to implement strategies now dating back several years. Um, inside of that uh, segment data, though, there was really some good news that we saw, which was three out of four adults that we surveyed said that they would switch gas or package good brands if they were doing something like offsetting the emissions tied to it. Now, of course, you have to do that and you have to communicate that effectively to your customers, uh, but we see opportunity there uh, within the sector, within convenience stores and gas stations. And while the sentiment around retail and convenience stores is uh, behind slightly other sectors today, we think that's going to continue to shift more towards a positive as retailers start to measure their environmental impacts and start to report on it. Um, and especially easy things or things that are already in process where things like EV charging becomes more accessible on the four courts. Um, and some of the things that Maxall and Circle K are doing there is going to help kind of raise the expectation and raise the, the sentiment around the sector. Well, that's a great tee up for, for the next segment. Just, I mean, just on that point before we, we bring Brian in, um, it is a big opportunity for gas station and convenience stores, isn't it, in a sense, in that the expectation from the consumer is at the moment not anywhere near as high as it is for for big box retail. Um, so those operators <clears throat> who can, who can, if you like, differentiate themselves, um, you know, we're going, are going to be well received, aren't they? Absolutely. And I, and I think to your point, uh, the bar being quote unquote lower, if you will, around convenience stores and gas stations um, allows us to exceed expectations. I think the other thing that we've seen, um, you know, really coming through these last 18 to 24 months is 
you know, retailers are starting to be less afraid about actually taking small steps towards implementation of strategy, right? It used to be, well, we sell, we sell fossil fuels. Uh, consumers are always going to um, give us a hard time about that. But the reality is, as, as folks have started to look at ESG and look at program solutions and engaging their customers, that fear is going away uh, and they're becoming more active. And, and with that, sentiment will continue to rise. Hundred percent, and and, I, and and as you as you show with this this chart, it's a, it's about really figuring out where they are on the on on yeah. on this uh, on this on this time track. Yeah, absolutely, it's a big piece of it. So so what we're looking at is what we call kind of the ESG strategy continuum. And you know, when Greenprint started almost ten years ago, we were really focused on a, a specific solution, right? So addressing scope three emissions for the retail and fleet industry. But as some of these insights that I've shared with you guys today. Uh, along with our experience working with retailers around the world, what we've what we've really realized is it's important to create an integrated strategy, not only to to build trust with customers, but to ensure the overall health of the business. And so, when Greenprint works with partners and how we look at ESG, we focus on these six areas of the continuum. And as you mentioned, Dan. Um, folks on this call, folks uh, in the real world are always at various points on this continuum, right? Some yeah. folks may not yet have started. Other folks have really robust ESG strategies. But when we help our partners, the first thing we're going to do is look at the target and measure, right? And so we're going to we're going to target and measure areas that can have a material impact on the environmental footprint of the business. So we're looking at things like the items they sell, how they transport and manufacture their goods. And then what we want to do is we want to baseline those against the industry and against their competitors so that they can start to actually have information uh, and make better choices in terms of their next steps. From there, well, I think that, that, that yeah. break, sorry, uh, no. Nate, did you want to come in? No, go ahead. Okay, well, I think you know that that perfectly tees us up to 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 really focus in on how a CEO can you know can make the difference uh, with 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 a strong with strong leadership on this, and how a business in our sector um, can uh, start to differentiate itself with with customers. So let's welcome. If you stay with us, Nate, sure. um, we'll invite Dev to come back in as well uh, and 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 listen in and watch. And Brian Donaldson. Uh, CEO of, of, of Maxwell Group um, and a great friend of mine. Um, how are you doing, Brian? Um, we've been talking, we've been building up to, to what you're doing, really. So you're the you're the you're the retail case study. <laughs> okay, look, Dan, thanks very much indeed. You know for the opportunity just to give an update. Uh, Nate, good to see you again, and also Deb, thank you very much indeed for your insights earlier. But ESG is something that any organization can't ignore in today's environment. Uh, it, it really has to be top of the agenda and it has to be top of the organization in terms of seniority. You know, Maxwell is a privately owned business. We're 101 years old and the McMullen family who own the business very much understand the importance in terms of buying into and supporting an ESG strategy. Um, particularly when you look at our industry, and we've been front of house in terms of selling high quality petroleum hydrocarbons for 101 years. So our job is even a little bit more difficult than some of the big box retailers in terms of how you build trust and how you build uh, confidence with the consumer that we're doing the right thing for the future. Um, so Really, as you've heard already from Dev, look, the landscape in the last 12 months, if anything, media attention has continued to focus on sustainability. There's been a change in the US with President Biden rejoining the Paris Agreement. So that focuses back on in terms of sustainability. Every government across the globe is coming out with a climate action plan. And therefore, you know, we as a business um, have a couple of things that we need to navigate in terms of challenges. You know, the first thing is um, we need to be able to influence legislation. All too often governments take advice from people outside of our sector who don't really understand the challenges that our business and many others within our sector are going to have to navigate to transition to that change. So I think as an industry, we have to be certainly at the table in terms of how we inform government because legislation must be fit for purpose. It must set realistic and achievable objectives. So that's one of the challenges certainly that we would have faced certainly in the last 12, 18 months, notwithstanding COVID. 
But also, you know, Nate touched on this too. If you're doing something, it has to be authentic. It has to be genuine. And from our perspective as a business, we buy in that expertise. And that's why we're partnering with Greenprint in terms of our carbon offsetting scheme following the launch of our premium fuels program. Dan, and I think this time last year when we started rolling out premium fuels, I'm, I'm pleased to say we've rolled it out to the 40 locations across Ireland that we'd initially planned. And, and the take up from consumers has been very pleasing. You know, it's double digit percentage of our overall volume sales. That's both south and north. So that shows consumers really do want to support those retailers which are trying to do their bit for the environment. Now, in the last sort of 12 months, yes, we've had to deal with people saying, Maxo, you're, car- you're greenwashing. But let's be honest, we're better starting this carbon offsetting program than doing nothing. And I think the other point that we would make, and this is where we greatly valued the input from, uh, from Nate and his team, everyone grabs the tree because everyone sees that about sustainability. And it comes back to Deb's earlier uh, point in terms of people you know, associated sustainability with farmland, agriculture, all of that. We decided trees were secondary to our carbon offsetting scheme. We wanted to invest in renewable projects that give that benefit now you don't have to wait 10 years for the tree to mature and grow and to, to capture that carbon. So to be quite honest, whenever we started communicating and explaining that to our customers, they got it. Uh, and, and again, that's where I, I go back to Nate's point. It's about having the right communications, not only for your customers, but also for our shareholders, but also for the people within the organization, within Maxo have to deliver our ESG strategy. And one of the, the things that any CEO has to do in the business is to make sure that the culture is fit for purpose. And, 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 and that's my job. You know, so really a lot of people would see ESG as, you know, it's a nice thing to talk about. From our perspective, we want it to be real and we want it to be authentic. And when you're looking at it, it within our organization, and I've already touched on some of the things that you can see in, 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 in the circle here. But unless you start measuring what you're actually doing, you don't know what progress you're actually making. Maxwell was probably no different to many other colleagues and competitors within our sector. We've been doing lots of good things with technology, lots of good things in terms of how we reduce our energy use over the last five to 10 years. But we haven't really been capturing it in terms of how we measure it. So one of the things that we have done uh, in the last 12 months is, again, brought in that expertise, which we didn't have within our business. So we now are collaborating very closely with KPMG in terms of how we now measure where we currently are in terms of our carbon footprint. And anyone who's in the middle of the ESG program will know that there's three scopes. We have scope one and scope two, which are all of the things that are directly within our control. That covers everything from the energy that we buy to to power and supply our service stations, to what we do in head offices, you know, to actually what we do with our supply chain partners, et cetera, et cetera. But in our particular model, we have actually scope three, which are really how do you indirectly influence and control other parties that work within your business? Those can be our third-party hauliers who deliver our fuels. It can be BWG Foods, or it can be the Henson Group, who are food service partners, or it can be Beauty's Coffee, you name it. But also, we don't directly manage any of our service stations. They're all licensed out to independent business people. So therefore, we have to influence them to make the right decisions so that we get the carbon footprint where we want it to be. Uh, and, and, and that's going to be a big part of our process over the next two to three years. So once you measure it, Dan, at least you know where you're starting from. And, and to be honest with you, uh, we've been doing lots of good things as a business. but We actually don't know where we are at this moment in time uh, in terms of where we're starting from. It makes sense. Just, Brian, just, just giving you a, a pausing there just to think about some of the things you've said and maybe to pick up on two points I, I the measurement thing i is absolutely vital isn't it i i i'm I, i'm sure you're 100 right on that and i can i can see why it's so important on this third party accreditation and the kpmg point that's another massive one as well isn't it because 
Nate, to your to your uh, point you made earlier in terms of where the consumer is, where you've been obviously tracking what's important to the consumer, they need that third party accreditation to be rock solid, don't they, in order for them to, you know, to open the door to, 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 to allow them to have a preference for Maxol in this case. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it, it can't be overstated the importance of, of having a third party, in our case, in the Maxall program and, and most of our retail programs, having Ernst & Young come in and actually validate everything from how the data is shared to us from, from the retailer in terms of liters of fuel, uh, fuel types, all the way through the methodologies that we're using to calculate the, the tailpipe emissions. And then, of course, on the on the very end of that, how is the carbon offset? Is it offset in a in a validated, certified way through projects that throw, uh, that that demonstrate over the long term that they're having the impact uh, that they're supposed to? And and I think a big component of that as well, and and Brian can talk to this because they've done a phenomenal job with it, is in the projects that you're investing in, what is the social impact of those projects? Are, are they doing things that have a, a social benefit to the communities where those projects are in terms of creating jobs and creating new opportunities for, for folks? So when, when we think about what the impact is that Brian and Maxall has had is, is not just on the, the scope three emission side, but the social impact on the communities where they're investing and in, whether it's through their nonprofit partners or whether through the, the carbon uh, projects that they're investing in as well. Brian. Yeah, look, there's so many things that you can do in terms of trying to move yourself forward. But the one that really stands out for me, it's all about the communications. Uh, and, and it's about having clear and accurate and easy communications for the consumer to actually understand. And one of the, the things I think with, which all of us will actually understand, sometimes what customers say is not what they actually do by way of behaviors. If everyone really wanted to do their bit for the planet, 100% of our sales would be premium fuels, but it's not. So it's trying to peel away those layers to try to get more and more people to move over to do the right things to what they want to do, but you've got to encourage them which to do that. And, 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 and that's where, you know, as a business, what we're trying to do is looking at our three core main businesses, which are convenience retailing across our network in Ireland. It's our lubricants business. It's our fuel cards business. In lubricants, we're also looking at can we use recycled packaging to host our, our motor care, our motor, uh, you know, lubricants range, our agri range. It's taking it to the next level. But it all comes back to this piece uh, in terms of investment. It's financial investment in doing the right thing, but it's also investment in the people resource that you have behind it in which to deliver it. In terms of the key areas that, you know, that we've tried to focus on, we've tried to focus on what can, what's the low hanging fruit? What's the immediate wins? There's lots of things that we're doing, which, which, which many people in this call will already been doing in terms of how they reduce their energy consumption in terms of LED, you know, rainwater harvesting, solar panels, hydro in terms of, 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 of another source. We're using boreholes now in terms of using natural water rather than using uh, you know, water coming in uh, from the grid. So there's lots of things that, that, that we're doing, which many other people are actually doing at the same time. And also then, even in terms of products, like advanced biofuels will also have a, a part to play, certainly in the next, uh, you know, the next 10 years. Um, electrification is being driven by the, the change in mobility and, 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 and regulation again on the car manufacturers. We as an industry have to be fit for purpose, but we can't do it alone. Uh, again, everyone in this call will, will understand that you cannot get the part at the right access point. So therefore, it needs to be a collaboration in terms of how we're going to join up the dots to make sure that we are all working together to do the right thing for the planet. And these are things that we have learned really in the last 12 months, Dan. You know, we would like to roll out a network of, of, of super fast EV chargers. We know it's a chicken and egg in terms of there really isn't the number of cars out there to service or even to support the investment. But it's going to take three years before even the grid is fit for purpose to get that part to the right locations in the first place. Mm -hmm. So these are all the things that 
not only we have a part to play, government has a part to play, and there are many other stakeholders have a part to play. So this sustainability subject certainly is absolutely critical, not for our generation, but it's for the next generation, my daughter who's coming along. It's, it's, it's for them that we're doing this for. And, and I think it, it, it really does demand real leadership because there are so many areas that need to change and, and it's so many stakeholders that are going to be part of the overall solution. Uh, but it's about working together. It's about setting realistic targets. It's making sure we in, influence the right government policy and legislation and be heard and, 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 and ensure that we work together. Very, very, very good, Brian. Just on the leadership and the business culture point, and maybe I could ask you this question, Deb, just to bring bring you in. I just as an example, I mean, I, I was on a call with um, with some retailer CEOs in in a number of different markets, and I asked them recently, and I said, "What's your number one problem?" And they said, "Well, it's labour, and it's also supply chain, and perhaps just thinking about labour as, as as one of the big issues." I mean, when the CEO, is, in this case, Brian, is really trying to you know really re, re change the, the business culture and reposition the business and lead on this subject you know for uh, we were already talking before we started the call how on the front line we are in in convenience retail how tough it is working in this sector and obviously you know we're seeing terrific uh, pressure on on on, on labor um in our sector and the food service sector in general so you know, company culture and leadership, uh, which which looks at the bigger picture, perhaps is pretty is is going to become more and more important for our sector, isn't it, Dev? It is for a couple of reasons. The it's very clear that those that are successful and leading in this space are doing so because at a point in time their leadership aligned the core purpose of the business with sustainability. It wasn't just uh, a project or a kind of sub part of the business that works in isolation to develop good stories it's absolutely fundamental to what they do the other reason i think it's it's very important is um that there are 63 percent of the uk working population at the moment that are reconsidering their careers and it's all part of this big emotional reset that's taken place um, over the last 18 months but even pre that period of time lots of very strong insight that said in order to retain and attract the best talent in your business, you have to be seen as a business that is socially responsible. And I always have the test of if I'm sitting in the pub or the coffee shop with my friends, is this a business that I'll be proud to talk about because they're, they're actually doing something, you know, which is responsible, decent, and in a public facing sense as well. So, you know, we're even this morning, lots of publications talking about the talent to, you know, retaining um, and the level of attrition in retail is huge. Um, if you are to survive, I think you need to be very positive as a business in, in, in terms of what you contribute um, in order to attract and retain talent. And that's that's really important. I think it's a, it's a massive point. Nate, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, without question. I mean, you, you're seeing it in all sectors uh, where, where employees now more than ever uh, what you pay them is not the, the, the sole driver of whether or not they feel fulfilled in their job. Um, you know, are they a part of a, a, an organization that is moving in the same direction, cares about the same things that they care about? Uh, and, uh, you know, as Dev said, uh, it's only going to continue to be something that uh, will become even more important. Yeah, yeah. Brian, um, I, 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 th I, think, um, I, think, I think we're impressed. Yeah, it's it's all about the people, you know. Like uh, the only point of differentiation any business has is the people in its organisation, because people can copy very, very, very quickly. Uh, and and one of the things that's always been very much a mantra within our business is you invest in the people. You you make sure there's the right culture. You know, we've used NACs in terms of training to take people out of Ireland to go into the states. We've sent people into Europe. We've worked very closely with yourself, Dan and Nick, for over, must be well over a decade now. And, 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 and that's where you learn. It's, it's, that's the value in terms of shop talk as well, in terms of, of, of what little nuggets you can take away to bring back into your business. 
But one of the things that, that any ESG program, if it's going to be successful, you have to have buy-in, not just from your board or from your shareholders, it's from everyone in the organization. Uh, and one of the things we're doing is looking at our strategic plan to 2027. ESG is up there as one of the primary projects that we have to deliver uh, in terms of the key milestones that we're setting ourselves. And it's only going to be done by the people and their buy-in in terms of, of, of really making it happen. Very good. Well, uh, you know, um, it, we, could, we could talk some more. We're going to carry on watching as your strategy rolls out, Brian. Um, you know, uh, there's all kinds of things you're working on, um, which we didn't have time to go into yet, which, which, which I, I think is, as long as the wind starts blowing in, uh, in Ireland will, 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 will be even more interesting, I think, next uh, to talk about next time. Nate, thank you very much for, for sh sharing with us the new developments at Greenprint. I think tracking this, as, as we said, is absolutely crucial to, you know, to getting a handle on it for retailers and, um, you know, um, differentiating, you know, differentiation with, uh, with, with brands as, as we go forward. And Dev, as I said before, you know, I think the work that you're doing with, with Scott and a whole host of authors with these shape of, of um, food retailing reports is, uh, is really valuable. So, you know, appreciate you sharing uh, your report um, host, or ahead, of, ahead of publication uh, with me. And I, I, I got a lot from it. I'm sure everybody will who, who, who reads it. So thanks everybody. And, um, you know, nice to, nice to get back into the saddle with shop talk again um it's a great way of staying in touch with what's going on and, uh, really really delighted you you could join us today thanks Dan. thank you very much indeed Dan. thank you so um just to, before we finish today um thanks very much to our guests that was an interesting discussion wasn't it you know it's uh, such a big topic uh, other topics uh, that we're focused on we've just been pleased to publish an interesting article on the Thailand market um, by Peter Gale, who's very much an Asian reselect expert, and he's, he's the NAC's relationship partner for Asia uh, and, a, and, a, and a, good, a, good, uh, a good hire uh, by NAC's as he knows the market very well. That's an interesting article you can read on Global Sea Store Focus. Other things coming up, of course, um, the NAC's show, this is the first time for 18 years that I won't be there travel restrictions still apply for UK passport holders. So it's uh, not possible to, for me to be there, but Shop Talk Live will be, um, not hosted by me, uh, although I might make an appearance on the program. It's gonna be hosted um, by, I'm delighted to say, Frank Beard, who's very much a, a big name in our industry, uh, in, increasingly in terms of uh, strategic opinions and uh, you know just general, uh, general uh, interest, really. Uh, Frank's a terrific guy. He's gonna be hosting Shop Talk Live from the NAC show because he's going to be there um, and delighted about that. We're focusing on food service, always a very important topic for our industry with two big players in the US who, uh, who know their stuff and are doing exciting things. Chris Hartman from Rutters and Tracy Ging from, from Come and Go, just doing some exciting things in that business. And Craig Panter, uh, who is the expert on this topic, um, you know, in terms of technology. Uh, will be telling us um, how Invenco fits into all of that. So that's to look forward to uh, on the 8th of October, live from the NAC show. One other thing, I'm, I'm off to Norway um, on Sunday, one of my first international trips for a while. And you'll, uh, if, you watch, uh, if you watch my LinkedIn, you'll hear more about what I'm up to there next week. Uh, until the next time, thanks very much for watching. Good afternoon. <laughs>